All right, we're going to kick things off. So good evening and welcome to the Sculptform Design Studio. Tonight's event is the inspiration from Indigenous heritage. So uh, my name's Kalani, I'm from Sculptform. It's so nice to see so many people back in our space. So welcome and I hope you enjoy yourselves. Tonight's event is being held on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and I wish to, sorry, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. Um, so just to provide a bit of an overview of Sculptform and what we do, uh, we're an Australian owned and operated um, business that specialise in the manufacturing of feature walls, ceilings and facade products. So you might see some of them around you tonight. Our manufacturing is based in Bendigo, Victoria, and we, thank you, and we opened this design space in 2020. Uh, the idea behind this space was to create a collaboration hub uh, where we could bring the design and construction community in, um, in a more central location here in the CBD. Now for the fun stuff, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Um, we're very fortunate to have our speakers with us tonight. So firstly, we have Pumiria Parata Goodall, who's joined us all the way from New Zealand. So Miss P is the director of Taipuka, and she's passionate about cultural identity and legacy. She's also a proud descendant of? Thank you, Miss P. I'm glad I didn't attempt that one. <laughs> um, so Miss P is currently a board member at the Arts Centre of Christchurch and of Lincoln University Council. We then have Bruno Mendes, a principal of Woods Bagot. So Bruno's approach to architecture applies a cohesive knowledge base spanning from conceptual design all the way through to project delivery across a broad range of sectors, particularly education and lifestyle. Uh, fun fact, Bruno was actually the main designer for the Sculptform Design Studio we're in tonight as well. And last but certainly not least, we have Claire Nunes, who is the Technical Director of Heritage for Biosis uh, New South Wales. So Claire has experience in providing multifaceted heritage surface services and on the construction projects, leading diverse teams and managing complex projects and delivering challenging st stakeholder engagement activities. She's interested in ongoing connection, but, but, sorry, the ongoing connection between people and place and the role of heritage. So just to uh, take you through the agenda for this evening. So Miss P and Bruno will discuss the story of the Taipei Convention Center in Christchurch and the process of cultural uh, consultation. And then Claire will discuss uh, a broader context of cultural and heritage consultation. And then we'll finish up with a Q&A session and then you're welcome to stick around and have some drinks and do some networking. So I will pass you over to Miss P. Katu a uki te taumata, te poho tama te a te mauka, ka titiro atu ki te moana, ko whakarau po erere atura, te rapaki o te raki whakaputa, tu mai ra te whare tipuna ko whake. Hui hui a mai te iwi e, tihei mauri, Ora e, e aku nui, e aku rahi nei rā, te tuku te mihi ki a koutou, uh, mai tēnei uri, tēnei uri o ngai tahu ngāti mā moe waitaha me ngāti kahungunu, uh, e mihi kawana ki a koutou, koutou o te hai, haukainga, uh, tēnei rā, te mihi kawatu ki a koutou. Translated, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Pua Media and I am a descendant from this fella. I see the world through different eyes. I am an indigenous person of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I am a descendant of this mountain. This mountain is my ancestor. 
and I bring with me the greetings of my ancestors to the ancestors of this land, and I acknowledge uh, the people of this land. Uh, we had an interesting discussion uh, leading into uh, tonight where I said one of the things for my traditional practices is I can't speak before I am welcomed by the people of this land. Uh, if you were coming to my land in Aotearoa, if you were coming to the South Island in Aotearoa, my people would stand and welcome you to our land. So it was important for me uh, to, to pay that respect that I can't speak before I am welcomed to this place. Uh, so I thank you for, for um, doing that for me. The way I tell the song I sung um, established my whakapapa, my traditional uh, genealogical connection to my mountain. The way we introduce ourselves with our tribal, with our tribal family, is that we always establish our connection to our land. Um, I don't exist without the land existing. I don't exist without the water that comes from Mother Earth. I don't exist without the air that comes from Sky Father Ranginui. I view the world through different eyes. Um, I view the world through an indigenous lens that I, I didn't realise was different from anyone else's. Kind of random. My ancestor in 1863 recorded this. The mountains are my ancestors. Ko ngā maunga, ko o kutupuna. The mountains are my ancestors. Because I view the world from the time of creation. My world is created uh, by uh, Papa Tuanuku, Mother Earth, Ranginui, Sky Father. Um, Sky Father had a first wife. It was not Mother Earth was some other lady. Uh, she had three, uh, four sons, amongst a number of other things. The first, the oldest of her sons was Auraki, now known as Mount Cook. My traditions tell me that uh, Auraki was born, his three brothers were born, uh, their, their mother was Pokoharua Te Pō, their father was Ranginui. After some time, um, Ranginui found a second wife and had a number of children. She became Mother Earth. The four boys decided that they needed to go and visit the stepmother, the evil stepmother. And so they travelled down through the heavens to Earth to view, to meet Mother Earth. While they were down there, um, I, I, have, I have a son. He gets hangry. If he doesn't have food on time, then he gets hangry. The boys got hangry. They fought. When they went, they tried to climb back through the heavens, um, the, the one that was responsible, Auraki, for doing the prayers to allow the canoe to rise back up into the heavens got interrupted by the hangry brothers. When that happened, the canoe in which they were raising up to the heavens smashed down to the earth. That canoe broke. The brothers clambered onto the back of that canoe and they stayed there for centuries. They turned into stone. The four brothers now form the backbone of the South Island of Te Wai Pounamu. The highest of those is the big brother, Auraki, otherwise known as Mount Cook. That's how my world gets created. That's who I see there. I don't see a mountain, I see my ancestor, Auraki. Why is that story even vaguely important in this? Bruno will tell you why. <laughs> Cultural design means that uh, this story was one of the very first stories when I met Bruno uh, was that I told him about. This is the story of the creation of my land. This is my world being created. How do you tell that in architecture? Why is that even an important story? Uh, because you're on my land. That's why it's an important story. Why is it that only I know this story? The story needs to be told so that we understand our connection to this land. So I told Bruno the story. He'll be able to tell you how that story gets told 
at Te Pai, at the Christchurch Convention Centre, we worked collaboratively on cultural design. So no longer was I not on my, long, like, on my landscape. I am a minority in my own land. My story sits in the land, but it wasn't being told. Through work with Bruno and Woods Baggett and teams that are willing to have conversation with Indigenous peoples, these stories start to come back out of the land and they start to become our stories. So who is this? This is Auraki. One of the other stories that follows on from this is the story of when Dad realises the four boys aren't coming home, he sends down his grandsons to look for them. <clears throat> he sends down three, three of his grandsons, and they come down and they find the four brothers now turned to stone on the back of the, on the, back of the canoe. So the three brothers, the three grandchildren, decide to clean up. One of them digs his heel into the land and he starts to rake, rake out the broken parts of that canoe into a pile. If you ever cr travel into Christchurch, look down on top of, when you fly in over, over the peninsula in Christchurch, look down and tell me what it looks like because I know what it is. This part here, Lake Waihora, is where my ancestor digs in his heel. It later gets filled with water. The, sp the broken canoe, which he drags up into a pile, becomes known as the Banks Peninsula. If you have ever flown over the Banks Peninsula, you will see that. Again, this story gets told in Te Pai. So I can talk story, but this man and his amazing team start to bring that to life in architectural form. Why is that important? I know the story. Now everyone who comes into Te Pai gets the opportunity to learn story. Another one of the, the boys that come down to clean up the broken canoe starts to form the waterways and again, he starts to rake up with, because these are big fellas, big, big fellas. And they're raking up all of this rubble and they're creating the waterways. And you can see this. This is Banks Peninsula. So you see those shapes that are forming there. Have a look at the outside of the auditorium at Te Pai. You will start to see these shapes appearing. Why is this important? Because this place then gets called the storehouse of my ancestor, Rākai Hautu. This is the next story in the series which says, the gods have now created our world, now humans arrive. Rākai Hautu is the man who is credited in our history as bringing the first humans to Aotearoa. The one place he settles is in the Banks, what is now known as Banks Peninsula, because it becomes the, the storehouse for Rākai Hautu. On the Banks Peninsula is everything you need. Everything you need. We, can, we had building materials, we had food sources, we had water. Everything that you needed to put into your storehouse was available on the Banks Peninsula. The fourth story that then followed started to talk about our people. And the wonderful thing about this, um, we start to see a form starting to appear. So I can talk story, but really, you know, anyone can talk story, mainly, mostly, kind of. However, we had the advantage that we had a number of uh, ethnologists, recorders, historians, whatever you want to call them, that travel and talk to my ancestors. 18... 1858, Charles Holbro uh, does this watercolour. I think it's 1850. Oh, 1855, there you go, sorry, 1855. This is one of their earliest images uh, of, of traditional village life in Canterbury, New Zealand. Why is that important? 
some of the iconography that you start to see appearing at Te, pa at Te Pai appear here. So now we're starting to translate not only stories, but also these things that were familiar on our landscape now start to appear uh, at Te Pai. We are by a river. The landscape that is now uh, outside Te Pai, outside the Christchurch Convention Centre, if you start to look at imagery like this, we are starting to recreate that biodiversity, so we're looking after environment, but more importantly, we're starting to bring back uh, some of those um, things that were obviously important to our old people. <coughs> the, the one thing that captures me in this image is the, the, the cross beam at the top of the house. Very, very unique um, in New Zealand, very, very unique to my region. The only place you start to see that iconography happening is in Canterbury, um, primarily in North Canterbury, um, but also a wee bit on the peninsula. Why is that important? Te Pai. The gateway, uh, the ceremonial gateway for the convention centre, looks slightly familiar. One of the benefits of ensuring that uh, Indigenous peoples are part of the co-designing of our facilities is you get a richness of story. You get a richness of authentic story. So you don't necessarily need to make stuff up. The story's already there. But more importantly, it allows conversation to happen. So this young man in this image is the great, great, great grandson of the man who owned that house in 1855. So there is a genealogical connection, there is a connection of the stories of what's important to us uh, in 1855 are still just as important to us in 2021 when this image was taken. The beauty of working with Indigenous peoples is that we get to speak story together. My comment, I guess the one thing I learnt, one of the many things I learnt in this process was early engagement. Don't, um, was, well sorry, first thing, early engagement. Second thing, continuous engagement. So one of my jobs back at the beginning of this process was to write a cultural narrative which taught the story. I am still struggling, even as of a week ago, uh, with uh, architects, with, in this case, a ministry, about them saying, you've produced a beautiful document, thank you for, it, for that, uh, we can just carry on and get, get it done now. I'm like, <clears throat> that document in that particular situation was created in 2015 for a project over there. Are you now telling me that my work here is done. They said, absolutely. I says, boy, have we got a conversation to have. <laughs> Thank you very much. That conversation in 2015 for that project over there belongs with that project over there. Um, you might call that early engagement. I don't. Uh, and secondly, that's not consultation, and this is not about consultation. Actually, this is about co-design. So thank you very much for your very kind offer. Declined. If you want the funding for this, you need to get the Indigenous voice beside you. You know what? I'm going to decline that. Can we have a conversation now about how we're going to start that again? That is proving to be a difficult conversation. I've had seven years' worth of experience now. I was sharing with Bruno at lunchtime uh, how I was quite green seven years ago, and now it's a non-negotiable. Early engagement, continuous engagement. Um, whose story is it to tell? It's mine. 
Who holds the IP? Me. My indigenous story is mine to tell. Although I might write you a document, that, does, that is not the beginning and that is not the end. Full stop. That's a great start. Early and continuous. I'm the one that can talk about the story and the significance because I see the world quite differently. There is a richness in allowing and allowing those conversations to take the direction they need to take and not being scared of that. The richness of story, the richness of acknowledgement, the richness of rebalancing the narrative. And that is my life story at the moment about rebalancing the narrative about there is history in this place. Before that building goes up, there is history in this land and now's the great time. In Christchurch, we just fell over. The city fell over. So we could start again. We can write whatever story we like, which we have been doing. Um, that gave us the opportunity to bring those stories back out of the land because one of the interesting, I think, things that... Um, You'll, you'll probably find too, is this notion about prehistory versus history, that my prehistory is kind of over there. Um, actually, my history is my history. It's not a prehistory. It is a history. So the richness of working with Indigenous people, I don't know about here, but I know in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're probably a little bit difficult. We're probably... Uh, uh, a little bit challenging, but the richness that comes out of that um, is found in these beautiful uh, buildings and these beautiful landscapes that start to address a uniqueness. This could have been a building anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, but it isn't. It is a building in Christchurch or Tautahi. The story that this building tells is unique. And it has a story. So I'll stop rabbiting on it now. However, um, I am grateful to be here today to talk a wee bit about you know, what's important to us uh, as Indigenous people in Aotearoa. Um, it's important to us to be telling our story alongside everyone else's story. Um, as a mi minority in our own landscape, it's taken us over 150 years to find our stuff but you know what we're going to be here forever so we will be uh, continuing to tell our story that's what legacy is about I think that's my 10 minutes up about 10 minutes ago tag <laughs> I won't sing. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. And it's really fantastic to have Miss P here. Um, it, like we said, it's been a seven-year journey. So I think it's critical that it starts, obviously, with Miss P. It's a lot of the storytelling and the narrative behind what we've done for such a long time was really, um, you know, underpinned by what, what she told us. So... Um, for me personally, it's been a huge privilege and for our, uh, for Woods Bagot as well and everyone that's worked on it and I see a couple of familiar faces here that also live that journey, um, to just have an opportunity to work on such an incredible project. Um, I'll, I'll, I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of things about the journey of the project. Um, it was a seven year journey, um, it was an international competition. Um, we were fortunate to, to win that competition and then I knew nothing about Indigenous culture, especially the local iwi um, that we um, obviously encountered in Christchurch. But, um, and, and I think for that, I think that's what I'm most grateful of. It's been such a great um, uh, educational and, uh, journey for us, um, thinking about creating a project that is not about your preconceptions of creating a big box, which most convention centres are. They're just big X-halls. And what we wanted to do was to 
in many ways, which is the way we kind of work, um, at least with a lot of the projects that I'm trying and and direct, is working with what's there and what's found. So um, this project is not your typical uh, big box typology. Um, it's a project that actually firstly started with um, being respectful to the site, um, people like Miss P um, engaging with various artists and actually demanding that we engage with Miss P. Um, to cut a long story short, it was only a, about a year and a half into the project that I literally said, Miss P, you're coming to Melbourne, we're sick of talking to white people in suits, which are basically all the politicians and the people that make the projects happen financially, don't get me wrong, but um, I just found it offensive that I could, <laughs> for us to interpret your stories without you being in the room, why aren't you telling your stories and then basically what happened was she came to Melbourne, we designed the project over or at least the narratives and, and some of the key moves over a few days. And Miss P was the one that then presented it back to uh, Sarah, the Christchurch um, authority at the time, um, which involved a number of key people and key stakeholders. And so I think that was a key moment for me. You know, it's your building, <laughs> let's face it. Um, I want to start with this as a young architect going over there. Um, one thing... New Zealand must have been at the front of the queue when God was handing out, or whoever was handing out beauty. It is truly an amazing place. If you haven't been, highly recommend it. Um, Christchurch, I think um, this is about 30 minutes out of Christchurch, 40 minutes out of Christchurch. I think it is Mount Cook. Um, these braided rivers was pretty much the image that I took on a very first site visit. It, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it is. This image has been on our server since day one. And um, it just really um, delineates the, the beauty of the, 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 the landscape. Um, and obviously, f you know, learning more about the, the true meaning of the landscape was, was fantastic. Um, it is f phenomenal. And yeah, like I said, I think what we tried to do as a team was initially with all the hurdles and the, you know, the, the usual issues of trying to make a building work to a budget fulfill all the all that all that stuff you know that's almost like in the background and it's noise that you don't you don't aspire to do that that should just happen um it's like saying a building needs to be on budget or a building needs columns like that's just a given i think for us we wanted to spend more time with making a building of its place and making sure that the building sat within appropriately within a context so we tried to make first of all we've made the building we reduced it by about twelve thousand square meters so a building that was um, meant to be a lot bigger ended up being uh, only eight twenty eight thousand twenty eight thousand uh, square meters in gfa which was um, one of the key moves to saying look you don't need to keep building big boxes let's make them smaller be a little bit more sensitive to the site the site is in the heart of christchurch it's on the avon river and that avon river is the most stunning bit of waterway it's covered in um, willows and it's basically the building faces that river uh, it also happens to back onto one of i think from memory there's only four cities in the world that are designed around a crucifix and christchurch is one of them so it's kind of bounded by that hand of colonialism and obviously the beautiful landscape um i was only allowed 10 slides i could talk about the project for a very long time but i wanted to put the most important 10 slides up and there's some images of the project because it's only just recently been finished but i think this is probably one of the key slides as well that kind of talks to a number of things in terms of you know traditional um traditional mokus, the carving, um, craft, you know. Uh, the local iwi, they, they've got fantastic kind of things that they make. Um, pattern making, crafting is something that is, is very, very big. So these are sort of things that we as architects kind of tried to, and designers, we tried to kind of embrace, but also some of the finessing of the building, like the patterns that kind of made their way onto the 
um, accessibility patterns and a lot of the pattern making also on the floor and the landscaping that was all designed by Miss by Miss P and her team. Um, so and this is some of that work uh, that kind of Miss P contributed to the project um, and led. To be honest, I mean we had zero. It literally just went from this straight onto some drawings that were measured and then it ended up on site. So that's the confidence that I had in Miss P and obviously um, all the artists that you brought to the table. Um, one of the key diagrams as well that we kind of talk about is is this diagram here of the building. So there's the, the Avon, um, there's the um, cathedral which is being rebuilt at the moment. Um, part of our trick was to try and make the big boxes as small as possible so the building is and i'm deliberately not showing you any technical drawings but it's a big x hall and it's a big auditorium that's split in two with some meeting rooms and a big pre-function that really the pre-function sort of foyer space is that element that allows us to scale the building down quite dramatically and engage with the river um, and then there's all these kind of elements uh, where the edges engage with these traditional ceremonies that we kind of, we went to a marae, which was an amazing, this was a beautiful thing as well. I still remember that marae before we started the project. Um, you inv invited us over to a traditional marae session. If no one's actually been to those things, it's storytelling. You go there, you leave everything behind you, you break bread and you tell each other stories. I've never done that in my life like you know so it was it was a really beautiful thing we got to know them they kind of got to know us for us um i think for a lot of people were kind of oh, what, what is this you know and they were kind of not getting it but i don't know it was nice just to be a passenger and be taken out of our at least my own comfort zone and just go you know we're going to try doing this differently so i think that was a really fantastic journey all of that work up front um, the building itself, um, you know, uh, it's it's um, in the landscape as small um, as possible. Part of the problem with this type of project is it always takes up everyone's scene. The Melbourne Convention Centre, they're huge projects, right? We didn't want to repeat that. We wanted to actually have something that, in terms of the materiality, the patterns, everything was more in keeping with the context and a lot of the storytelling from Miss P um moments like this where it's really all about the reflection this is the main one of the key entries into the building reflects the context the avon river um and then some of those things that miss p was talking about the raking of the landscape you know they, these are and this is where um sculpt form comes into this um this this picture here these are massive one and a half meter wide um about uh, 800 mil deep scallops within the pre-function area and it's that raking um, narrative of the, the story um, and that wraps all the way around the Banks Peninsula, that um, the blue, this is the main auditorium space um, and the sort of formally, um, you know, the, the braided rivers, that image that we took very early on was something that really affected us at least as a team to try and have something that was quite sinuous was more in keeping with the avon river rather than the colonial grid that sits right behind it so the building really sort of you know it, it kind of transitions from the grid on the right there to the fluid left hand side um, so that's it from me um, i think all i wanted to kind of say was um it's been a, an amazing journey to work with yourselves. Um, I really, really enjoyed the process of not being in control of the output of the project. The project is very much um, a co-design with, with your team and that's been a, a really fabulous journey um, just to kind of learn a little bit more about how, how to do things uh, differently and learn about your incredible culture, which, um, yeah, has been you know, a real joy and, and an honour to be part of, to be honest, because you don't get these sorts of opportunities all too often. So that's kind of me. Thank you so much. Thank you. How do I go from that? <laughs> now I get the heritage consultant at the end. 
Um, <laughs> I'll try and keep it lively. I can't <laughs> sing, that's for sure. Um, thank you. That was brilliant, both of you. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what I wanted to do was kind of build from that very real experience that, that you guys are talking about. Um, and look at, um, I guess, approaches or discussions that are happening in uh, the design, construct, you know, project management space. Um, I do want to acknowledge that um, we're on Wurundjeri land and, and thank you for, for having me um, in Melbourne. I'm from Sydney, as they say. I'm from um, Roobra, which is Gadigal and Bidjigal land. Um, and even the fact that we talk about that now in presentations and discussions and meetings, um, as much as, I don't know, some people might think it's tokenistic, the fact that we're actually talking about it, I think is really important. Um, so I, I'm just uh, so encouraged by that, actually. Um, I wanted to start a little bit at first principles. I won't, I won't bore you too much, but <clears throat> as a heritage consultant, we often get brought into projects like the ones uh, that you guys were talking about. And I see our role as facilitators as much as anything, because when you think about looking at heritage, it's not my heritage. It's, it's you know, I may be part of the place that we're looking at, but oftentimes we're, we're brought in to really facilitate discussions and um, translate almost from, you know, design speak, legislation speak, planning speak, um, and really engage with communities. So when we look at heritage coming into projects like this, I think we, we really actually need to go back to first principles and not think about a thing so much. We need to look at um, values, traditions, customs, associations. It's as much about the intangible as it is the tangible. Um, and so really um, going into each project, we need to have our eyes open. Um, and it's really hard to do that as a person, actually, as a human. Um, there's lots of assumptions that we make. There's lots of, um, you know, preconceived ideas and things that we've learnt. And so it's really important, I think, each time that we look at a project to sort of break it down into its most simplest form and actually communicate and engage. Um, so, again, not, not to bore you too much, but when we start to look at the discussions that are happening, um, Ms. P talked quite a lot about it, that we've been pushed into, into a particular space when we look at heritage often. And that's come from um, a place where I think, you know, governments and, and community organisations really had the notion that places are important to us and we want to protect them. And you would see a lot of that in um, the second half of the 1900s, lots of, um, you know, Places that were to be demolished were, you know, there were rallies against that. There was, there was this sort of community movement to look at um, protection of places. Now that, and that's excellent, right? That's great. That's, that's really encouraging and it's actually saved a lot of the places that we sort of know and love today. But in doing that, um, we get into the whole space of regulation <laughs> and politics and government. And the way that uh, things are protected at the moment is that we put them into categories and we put them on lists and we separate them and we say, well, that's a natural place or that's a historic and this is that whole exactly prehistoric, <laughs> historic, <laughs> uh, pre-contact, contact, Aboriginal. And so we've got this categorisation. Um, the legislation dictates the way that we look at that. So on, you know, construction projects, there's environmental planning processes that we have to follow. Um, and that really dictates a lot of the way we engage. There's very specific um, planning legislation that says you must engage this way for 28 days, you must stop, you must do this, you must have, you know, one of these meetings, you must have send, you know, letters to this community. It's very regulated. So that's kind of where we've got pushed to in terms of heritage and protection. Um, in the last sort of few years, what has come about is there's, there's more discussion about that. There's a lot more discussion about, yes, we've, we've gone through the process of protecting and we do want to protect, but actually how do we do that? And how do we do that flexibly? And what are we actually protecting? Like, what's the reason? Why are we doing this? 
Um, in uh, the Commonwealth Government, which I used to work there for a while, interestingly, their approach was always to look at values first and ask first. Um, and so it, it sounds interesting that the Commonwealth Government <laughs> was actually um, leading the way in some ways um, because it wasn't necessarily place-based. It was, are you going to impact the values of a place? That could be within a line or outside the line, or if anyone remembers like the paper pulp mill, it could be something, you know, five kilometres downstream. And so it was a very values-based approach. Um, and they produced these guidelines as well, like ask first, engage early. Um, these have been around for quite some time. They're actually a little bit out of date, to be honest, but the conversation had started already. Um, Again, in, in uh, New South Wales, there's the Government Architect's Office is, is heavily engaged in this space in terms of looking at design and engaging um, with country. And so country with the capital C. Um, country with the capital C is obviously a, a very, you know, broad term which means different things to different people. And if you haven't endeavoured to look at what that means, I encourage you to go do some research um, as to what country means to different people. Um, but this is one of the examples, this designing with country uh, draft, actually, framework that's out at the moment. Um, and it's encouraging exactly what you were talking about. It's, it's saying engage early in a genuine way, regardless of what planning legislation tells you to do. So it's regardless of how many days and how many times and how many you know, applications you put in, what it's actually saying is it's now time to start a lifelong relationship and you may have connections with a community multiple times over multiple projects, but now is the time that the lifelong relationship needs to start and it needs to be acknowledged on an ongoing basis. It doesn't stop, it's continuous. And so this is, and to be really honest, it's challenging a lot of people because it's gone from heavy regulation of you do X, Y, Z, and it's moved to you need to engage, you need to communicate, you need to think about what you're doing. And it's, it's very undefined. Um, it presents principles and ideas and theories and it doesn't tell people what to do in a prescribed way. And so it's challenging but it's, it's starting the conversation. And I think that's the point, it's starting the conversation, which is great. Um, so, I, again, I'm not an Aboriginal person. I, I don't speak on behalf of Aboriginal people. Tonight, this is just me reflecting on some of the projects that I've been a part of. But um, one of the things that I sort of worked on when in the Commonwealth was international heritage and world heritage, and it really, ingrained in me from a very early time that Indigenous people have the right to speak for their heritage. And, and that is at like the highest level. And it's not about um, a one-off conversation. It's about management, you know, sustainable development, the whole thing, you know, at the highest level. That is the principles that we're kind of working from. So... What does that mean? <laughs> Again, just some of my learnings is, you know, ask first. It's exactly what you said, it's ask first. But it's not only ask first, it's asking first in thinking about, I communicate this way and I'm quite happy to be here in this really formal setting and you know, I might make some mistakes, but who really cares? Um, some people might be completely uncomfortable and this is not an appropriate setting or, um, if you're speaking up about place, can you actually be in that place? Can you not be, you know, 600 kilometres up in like the Sydney when you're actually talking about something in like Broken Hill or something like that? Um, think about how you engage. And if you don't know who are the right people to engage, just, just ask. And I guarantee you'll get passed from maybe one person to the next person to the next person, but that's okay because you're having a conversation. And so don't think that it's wrong to ask, it's ask. <laughs> um, and not, so the next one's not only just think about what would make people feel comfortable, but also empower people to help make decisions. So are you giving all the information to actually make an informed decision? And this, this I think, is across all communities, right? Like it's not just 
a particular community. It's actually community consultation. Um, again, as you said, the collecting and storing of information, something may not be appropriate to be um, shared, collected, even written down. Think about that and just ask. And the last one actually, <laughs> we must have written our thing together, I think. We so. were reconnected. Um, consistent, follow through. Um, as you say, like that whole, you know, 2015, um, stay engaged, keep, keep the connection up. It's not one and done. As I said, it's like a lifelong, you know, relationship that you're forming. And people want to know how the projects go. They want to know if it's successful, if it's constructed, like keep that relationship going. <coughs> um, look, these are just some... Um, reflections as I say <laughs> um, and I, I found that that the notion of um, history and laid history is really challenging it's very complex um, what history do you reflect in what place I like to think of it as a, a continuum of history we are all impacting history where we exist in time so we're, every, each generation has has done that and will continue to do that and we'll continue to add layers. Um, but think about all of those layers and how you're actually, you know, reflecting on all of them. Genuine connections, as I say, not tokenistic. Community is at the core. Um, move beyond compliance. <laughs> and this is something that um, I think is changing as, as we sort of work on more projects. But I think the baseline needs to be shifted. So the baseline at the moment is you've done an assessment according to the, you know, the planning legislation. That's the baseline, but I think actually more and more the baseline is shifting and the baseline is shifting to beyond compliance. Um, change the conversations. As you say, don't start with what's the bottom, you know, what's the bottom dollar? How can we fit as much GFA in as possible? Just change, you know, start to change those conversations. Create places. And create places that you'd be proud to tell your kids about. <laughs> I know that's not always, you know, the front of mind, but that, that's what we're doing, right? We're creating something. And that sort of links in the, the last one, build a legacy. Um, and share knowledge. So we all have skills that we bring to these, these teams, these design teams, um, and share it. It's not a competition. No one gets a little ribbon for like knowing the most or whatever, knowing more than other, like just share. <laughs> No, you don't, sorry. <laughs> okay, you do. All right, you get one. You get a ribbon. And you get a ribbon. <laughs> um, I thought I'd quickly... Sorry, I'm talking a really long time too. Um, I'd quickly talk about a couple of projects that I was uh, fortunate to be a part of. One is coming to completion, a little bit controversial. Uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, they, they've done a completely new uh, extension. So it's actually a standalone building next to the current Art Gallery. Uh, international design competition with Sana Architects and Architectus. One of the really um, interesting things about this process is that it was on a, a really heavily disturbed site. It's built on top of like the Carl motorway um, and also some World War II oil tanks, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but what they did from the very beginning, yes, we had to do planning legislation and applications, and it, but from the very beginning, there was a, a reference group and it was, it was genuinely used as part of the design team. It was anything from the landscaping to the materiality, um, the curation of the contents of the new gallery, where different contents should be in the building. And it was a genuine... Um, connection with that group of people and that's that completely I think changed that project from from what it could have been um, so that's currently under construction you can see it's a very <laughs> very controversial uh, in in you know some colonial uh, garden setting etc cetera, etc cetera, um, it creates again another layer and a significant part of that was the connection with the water so it faces out straight out onto the water and a lot of the, the glass was put in particular locations to create like that in outside kind of concept. Um, moving to a much smaller but 
really lovely project at the Leagues Club Field because that's what it's called <laughs> uh, in Gosford. It was a it was a park where heaps of people played footy. It was underutilised, um, and the community was actually crying out for it to be. Um, I guess, remade into a place that they'd all be proud and happy to take their kids and and meet up, you know, on the weekend. And so Turf Design was the landscape architect and they worked in conjunction with um, the Darkenjung uh, Aboriginal Land Council and uh, the Land Council identified local artists uh, to work with. Um, again, it was a disturbed site. So in the, in the, in the context of environmental planning, we had to do the assessments, but that actually wasn't what it was about. It wasn't about um, physically archaeology and all that sort of stuff. It was actually about creation of another layer of a new place, of a new kind of um, place where people could come together. And so very early on, we had workshops with the uh, Duck and Jung Land Council. We worked through everything, the use of the place, you know, what would you want your kids to just sort of see, actually, can we rehabilitate some of um, the vegetation, what type of vegetation, what type of plantings, the whole thing. And a really early on, this has gone on to win so many awards, um, had the smallest budget to squeeze it in and they absolutely did exactly what you said. They've just, they knew that they had a budget but that didn't matter. They just focused on what's the bigger picture. Um, this is just some of... I guess the elements um, that reference like fish traps, there's a significant connection to water which had been cut off by um, the motorway which you can sort of see hiding behind those trees. They tapped into the harbour underneath the motorway and this pool that you see here is a tidal pool. So as the harbour sort of like ebbs and flows, that pool will fill up and it will go back out again. Because one of the significant yeah, connections was with the water. It was such a resource for people and it continues to be such a resource for people. So they wanted to bring that back um, from what the damage that that motorway had done. <laughs> um, yeah, so just, just such a, a brilliant outcome. The last thing, I'm not going to bore you too long. The last thing I just want to say is, is if you haven't started to look at some of the, the material, like material out there, start reading. There are so many um, amazing authors who are producing work on this space. This one is part of, um, it's called the First Knowledges series and there's a connection um, with the Australian Museum. I think as well they've done like a video sort of series as well. This one's called Building on Country and it's by Alison Page and Paul Mamot. And I think anyone who's in any kind of design space needs to read this or read material like this because it takes you through um, traditional architecture of Aboriginal people for, you know, thousands and thousands of years and it starts to bring that into um, design space today and how we can reference that and it's just such an amazing um, book to read. So I just want to finish on one paragraph from this book because it's just so amazing and it's not my words and I don't want my words to be the last thing you hear. God heavens. <laughs> Country-focused design is an attempt to reinvigorate ancient conversations about the human connection to nature and how the built environment can play a vital part in this dialogue. It is as much about a process as it is a product and that it goes beyond stylized homage to plants and animals. From the first marks on the page to the decisions by governments to the materials used in the fabric of the buildings and the public domain. Every step has respect for country at its core. And, um, yeah, I think I'll finish on that because they say it better than I do. <laughs> Thanks. I think I speak on behalf of everyone. Thank you for your time this evening. It has been super insightful and thank you for sharing your stories. We'll hand over to a question... Uh, question time so if you have any questions raise your hand and we will ask our speakers and that one's going to be hard to summarize but essentially it, how how to communicate how to use the right language that everyone understands language is an interesting thing isn't it 
So I um, <clears throat> I am a generation uh, in Aotearoa uh, who is the bilingual generation. My parents and my grandparents were punished for speaking our native language. Uh, so English became their first language. Uh, by the time my generation has been born, uh, the tides had turned somewhat and we were starting to reclaim our language. <clears throat> It takes one generation to lose your language. It takes a minimum of three to gain your language back again and it to be normal. So I am the, bi the, first, the first round of bilingual generation. My granddaughter, who is due in October, whoop, whoop, um, <laughs> uh, will be the generation whose first language will be Māori, second language will be English. <clears throat> What that means in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is that will be a significant shift for us uh, to go to a bilingual nation uh, as opposed to a monolingual nation, of which the, the only language that everyone knows is English. So in conversations, it's always been quite interesting that I naturally am bilingual. So I realised tonight I've spent a lot of times speaking Māori and I'm thinking <laughs> I'm probably the only one that understood what I just said then uh, because that is my my language. <clears throat> so sitting in meetings uh, with uh, architects, design teams, uh, engineers who speak engineer language and uh, you know botanists speaking botanist language and landscape architects I'm just like it's a green plant surely. Uh, <laughs> It's pretty, let's just have one of those. Um, language becomes really important. <clears throat> and acknowledging when we don't know what the other person is saying um, has become really important. Uh, going forward, what that has meant is that you will have noticed the building is called Te Pai. That was purposeful. So Te Pai, uh, in my language, means the porch. So when we thought about that building in the context of Christchurch City, what were we thinking about? We were thinking about this is the place, traditionally the best discussions our people ever had were when we were sitting on the porch looking out at the sunset and the family had gathered out there after a meal and we were just chatting and laughing and sharing and talking story what was the convention centre to us? It was that porch. This is where we come to just chill with each other, talk to each other, share information. So when we thought about the name for that, we could have called it the Christchurch Convention Centre. But we negotiated. Let's talk about Te Pai, the porch. What are we doing there? What is the function of this place? What is the important bit of information that we want to share with the world? Uh, when we had this discussion, I remember splashing up all these pictures and going, what's this place? Sagrada Familia. I was like, hmm, so you can say that word. Nice. What about this place? Tiananmen Square. Hmm. So that's another language, isn't it? So I, you know, I went around the world with these pictures going, what's this? What's this? If I can say it, then actually so can you. What is the story behind that name? And realising, of course, names are very important. Names talk history. So all of a sudden, language didn't become an issue. I, you know, I'm sitting there going, you're having problems saying, Te Pai, Sagrada Bamiya, Te Pai, Te Pai, two syllables. Sagrada Familia, just saying, the Louvre, just saying. Um, so language does become important, the benefit, the opportunity that we've taken as, as um, Māori is our language is an official language. It is official language of New Zealand. Um, yes, yeah, 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 yes. Um, and so the opportunity that we have leveraged out of all of these discussions, is this is an official language, it is the first language of this nation. All of the wayfinding, 
all of the names of the buildings, if it is bilingual, the first name is Te Reo Māori. The first thing uh, on the on the stacking of the signage, the name, the word is Wharepaku. The second word is toilet. So it's been a significant change. Uh, it is a significant change for our whole country that we are recognising first language. Fortunately, we only got one <laughs> first language, not several hundred. Um, and, and although we have different dialects, it is still one language. It is Te Reo Māori. So important, important for us that, um, yes, the conversation started very difficult. They were difficult conversations because everyone was speaking their own speak. Um, with that ongoing conversation, um, it became easier. For Māori, we just took that little lever and we yanked it all the way down and said, thank you very much, by the way, uh, that is Wharepaku Toilet. And the name of that building is Te Pai. Sirakarara Whamia Te Pai. We can do this. Um, so important because it starts to identify loca the location this place, what is the story of this place, what is the language of this place, you then start to get that authenticity of this is somewhere in Aotearoa. This is not somewhere in New York. This belongs and it anchors us right here. And I've talked too much. Tag. <laughs> I was just going to quickly say, for, uh, with our process, uh, it also meant we needed to kind of understand who was in the room. So typically, uh, which again, I'm saying this in contrast, say for what we're doing with the Aboriginal Arts and Culture Centre in Adelaide, where you've got um, a very different process when we're in, uh, engaging with the Indigenous uh, people. In our case, it was just Miss P presenting. So in terms of the key stakeholders, it would have been Miss P, myself as a translator, instead of our team, Woods Baggett, translating her stories, you tell your stories to the suit over across the other side of the room that this story is an important story. So we try... We just try to cut down the bureaucracy of the process. I don't think that anyone meant um, any harm. I don't think there's also a manual for engaging with every process is so different, right? So we just try to, um, I suppose, make it more straightforward and, and let Miss P speak when she needed to. And that was it. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. If we did it again, it'd probably be another... <laughs> the process who knows right i think the thing i've learned is just to we have learned should i say the whole team is just to be open-minded and engage that's all oh, i <laughs> already said all everything which is say um i guess the only thing in terms of what you were saying about the language um some of the the ways i think that that I've seen on projects that it's been really beneficial, as I said, is actually to be in place as well. And so there's something about uh, translating meaning when you're in place versus removed. Um, and something happens that it's, I guess it's, I don't know, it's easy to understand. There's the visual cues, there's the sounds, the smells. You, you might not even have to capture that in words, but it's, it's being there and present um, and connected to that place, I think often takes the place of, of words as you like. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, as again, I'm not an Aboriginal person, I can't speak for community, but um, there's hundreds and hundreds of languages, obviously, um, for Aboriginal people. And um, it's kind of like, you know, multiple countries versus dialects. So it's it's very different. Actually, this book explores a lot of that. Um, yeah. I think that's enough. Summarising these questions is difficult. <laughs> um, but I think community engagement is the core of that and how to facilitate that from both, you know, speaking of the design and then also making sure that they're comfortable with the design in the end. So I think Claire does a lot of this day to day and then she might be able to pass on to Miss P to talk to the other part of that question. 
Um, yeah, there was a lot in that question. I'm trying to like <laughs> tap into it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I no, I totally look. The, again, as I said, one of the things is is to ask, and you'll often get um, community who has right to speak for a place versus land council. So I know there is genuinely. Um, uh, conflicts between people who acknowledge uh, Aboriginal land councils who are set up by a government authority. It's again a very regimented um, process with, with which governments have thought, well, this is going to be beneficial to everyone, so we'll do land councils and there's your country and there's your country and, and let's do it like that. There's, it, there's two sides of it, right? Because it does provide opportunity land councils there is you know economic there's employment there's voice um, in particular forums but again it's it's been determined by people who are not from community that that's that's the process then you, then you have um, people who want to speak for country um, there's processes at the moment which we we do do that we call for registered Aboriginal parties to say, would you like to be part of this project and speak with us about about it? Again, highly regimented, um, you know, government sort of environmental planning processes. I guess the only thing I'd say is um, when you go through those, there's, there's the baseline again, as I said, that's the baseline, right? Once you start to talk to people, they'll say, hey, you know, Glenda, you need to go to talk to Glenda because she was, you know, da da da, and she knows all about this and that. And then you sort of build on that, and you're constantly building on those connections with people and the communities. Oh, you meant the broad, like as in the broader community. Yeah. <laughs> they love it. I think it's amazing. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, but that's I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at. The land council is at the moment the the voices that speak on behalf generally for these kinds of projects in terms of like the figureheads. That that's who would who would speak. And that's who has in all of the like say the award ceremonies for that project, they've gone and it's been a joint uh, land council and turf design kind of award. So they have spoken. Yep, 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 that's what I mean, it's joint, at, at, at any kind of um, discussion about the project or like the design presentation, so it was run by the Hunter Central Coast Development Corporation, the design presentations were joint with TURF and the Land Council, so it was, it was joint, that, that's the process, so you, you add more than me. <laughs> So it's important, you know, one of the things as a minority in your own land uh, is you learn about communication and about bringing people with you. Uh, so I am of that community where this particular, well, most of, most of these projects that I work on, I am a descendant of the people of that land, firstly. I am also a member of that community, so I wear a double hat in that space. Uh, and when we are uh, first layer of, of work is often with our own people, so our own communities. So but when we start any of these projects, the first question is, do we want to be involved in this as the descendants of this piece of land? Uh, do we want to be involved in this firstly? Secondly, what do, would we like to share? Um, we still control the information that we share. Because there is some information that actually only belongs to your community. We don't want to share that bit. This is ours. Because as soon as you share it, then you lose it. A, you share it, and that's awesome, but also you no longer have control over what gets done with that information. So there's always those uh, interesting conversations of, do we want to share? How much do we want to share? What does that mean? Um, so those are the first layer of conversations that happen in our own private communities. The next commun the next part, part of it, and it becomes legislation, is then how do you tell the community? 
this is now happening um, and uh, to some degree uh, allowing them the opportunity to input into that process but knowing of course that in Aotearoa uh, we are firstly a bicultural society so we recognise the people of this land we then recognise uh, the coloniser that then comes in we thirdly then acknowledge everyone else who has come in after that. We are then multicultural, but first we are bicultural, second we are multicultural. So during that first layer of getting the foundation in as bicultural partners, we signed a treaty in 1840 to say we were partners, that puts in your first layer, the next layer of consultation is to say to everyone else who is then in our space, in our community, do you want to input into this? What is it you want to input into it? And by the way, here's the foundation. Here's the bicultural story. So it's always layer upon layer that gets laid into these conversations and trying to bring community with you. Uh, that then sets yourself up for um, the next part of this, which talks about you can create beauty, absolute beauty and magic but sometimes it's too subtle that the story's lost. So how do you make sure you tell the story? And that comes in, you know, these opportunities to have these kind of sessions. Where are the interpretation boards? Where are the videos that talk about the name of this building is Te Pai, that refers to this. The name of the auditorium is this, the design elements in that tell this story. So there's all the, always these layers of story that... Um, don't just stop with the beautiful building now being opened. There is still lots more work to be done. Um, so uh, if, you, if you've got someone like me who after seven years is a bit more bold and brave and will go, hey, hang, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, let's talk about this, let's let the world know about this because this is important. I didn't do all that work for it to be lost. And, oh, it's a beautiful building. Yep, it's a beautiful building that's built on this piece of land. This is what was important about this piece of land. So, some, yeah. One of the discussions that um, yeah, initially, when we started the discussions about this building and a number of other buildings I've worked on since, um, it was always you provide a cultural narrative, which talks story, and then you step out of the conversation. This, this was the opportunity for us to stay in the conversation. And so all of these discussions, it becomes it's normal now with all projects that we are talking about, as the cultural advisor, we are talking about materials. We are talking about the colour palette. We are talking about the textures. We are talking about uh, the plants that are now going into the landscape. We now have the ability to have all of those discussions because it all relates to our cultural needs and recognising the story coming from the land. Um, <clears throat> those were initially not very easy conversations to have, and I had no, no expertise in any of them, actually. Uh, but, you know, alongside the rest of the design team, we're all learning at the same time. Um, and to have those conversations quite openly now about what we know about this is that these five plants were naturally here. All the archaeology tells us that all the landscape architects and the, the botany people, science people, plant people, green people, um, have all the evidence that tell us that this is so. So why wouldn't we put it back? Um, all our artists and our weavers are saying these are the materials of which we were weaving. We were gathering them from here. All our natural, um, we call them rongoa, uh, Māori medicines, so the, me the the native plants, trees that we were using, we can tell you where they were. Why wouldn't we put them back? Um, so being able to have all those conversations about materials, being able to have the discussions about what was here before, why wouldn't you put it back, um, becomes really important. But one point I'm just going to jump on here before I get kicked off again. Um, is that these conversations take a lot of time. Um, most of us started out this game doing it voluntarily in our spare time. 
So, you know, when you think about these conversations, someone's taking time out of their life to do this stuff. Um, someone's taking their IP uh, and putting that on the table. Someone is taking their history and their family's history and their family treasures and they're putting it on the table. That needs to be resourced. And that needs to be considered Right from day dot, you are asking communities, indigenous communities, to give up stuff that comes at a cost. Uh, we fought long and hard, um, the, the organisation I worked for, to make sure that that was given the value that it deserved. Uh, we were also, um, when we engaged artists to help us tell a story, that comes at a cost. That is not the beautiful thing that gets added on and then when we run out of money, that's the first thing that comes off the list. Uh, we learned really quickly the word called integrated art. Goodness me, you can't get rid of that because it's the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it is not the thing that gets stuck on the wall. It is the wall. Um, so taking that into account when you're working with our communities is that this comes at a cost to our communities. That does need to be factored in. Um, and the third thing that I just wanted to make while I've got the mic, uh, the opportunity was to talk about um, IP. So we provide information, our artists provide their expertise to, to bring to life a number of these stories uh, and then our architects, our landscape architects go out for awards uh, for the beautiful buildings, the built beautiful artwork that now exists within these buildings and sometimes our artists are forgotten and sometimes our indigenous communities are forgotten and we hear about uh, design teams getting amazing awards and yet those people who have given their IP to create this beauty alongside those design teams are sometimes not even mentioned. So I have a plea to all of us to recognise the many people that contribute uh, to these amazing buildings, these amazing landscapes, and ensure that they are being recognised and they are being asked, is it okay if we use this stuff for this award? Often we're not being asked. My mother is an artist. We found out about an award for her work uh, on the news. And I went to the architect and I went, uh, hello. We don't need anything else but recognition. The least you could have done was name my mother as the artist. She was down at the fourth layer of the award and we hadn't, didn't know. So my plea, uh, when you are asking community, when you are asking artists, ensure that they are involved from the beginning to the end and everything after the end. Um, this is as much about them giving their heart as it is for anyone else in the, the team. So please acknowledge our artists. Please acknowledge community. I don't think we could have ended on a better note. So thank you for sharing your learnings, your knowledge and your stories tonight. I think we've all learnt something and we'll all take away from tonight's session. So thank you everyone for coming along as well. Please stick around, have a drink, have a mingle and discuss tonight's topic. Thank you.